the title for for uh, the pa panel is new policy challenges and reform needs for the EMU. So I, I think a, a good way to, to uh, spend the first part of this panel is essentially to ask uh, each of the speakers, I think uh, um, most people have some, some slides to show, to, to uh, give their views on this topic of new policy challenges and reform needs. So of course, um, uh, uh, when we've been discussing this, this topic, uh, some of the issues that, that come up, and each speaker will, will focus more or less on different dimensions, is of course, uh, you know, the, the topic of the month is the EU Economic Governance Review and reforms the Stability and Growth Pact. Uh, more, more generally, of course, uh, throughout these years, uh, we initially had a whole wave of work about the implications of below target inflation for fiscal policy, and then more recently, the implications of above target inflation for fiscal policy. Uh, you know, it obviously interconnects with the uh, governance review, but there is a more general topic, which is global about the sustainability of public finances. And indeed, for that matter, the sustain sustainability of private sector finances. Uh, uh, no, no discussion of this topic would be complete without also extending the discussion uh, to, include, to include the ESM reform. And of course, we should all be learning uh, from, from a major innovation during the pandemic, the next generation EU initiative, uh, which, which is really a, a new level of, of fiscal governance in, in Europe. So the format, to repeat, is I'll ask each of the speakers uh, to make some opening uh, remarks around these topics. Then we'll uh, have a set of second round questions for each panelist, and, and then we'll be able to move to Q&A from the floor. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm not going to try to introduce all the speakers who are all very well known, but I think we have, we have a good mix uh, uh, you know, in terms of the composition of this panel. And uh, in alphabetical order, uh, the first uh, uh, panelist is Sylvia. So over to you, Sylvia. Thank you very much, Phil, and thank you for uh, inviting me to this excellent conference and to participate to this panel. Now, uh, we have, I think, seven minutes for our introductory remarks. So I have decided to tackle uh, two questions today. So first, uh, the first question is that I will take a look at history and I will simply update some of the literatures that ask the how can countries successfully restore sound fiscal policies. And the second, I will look at the future and ask whether high debt euro area countries are on track for success. Now, uh, after this morning talk by Roberto, you might be, uh, I would say, tempted to just switch off right away. But I hope you can stay with me for five minutes. And at the end, I will share you uh, a few thoughts on this literature in general. But for the time being, I will just, uh, given the time constraint, highlight a few stylized facts. I will discuss some ingredient, ingredients for success. Uh, almost in a cooking recipe format, without any discussion of the whys, nor any attempt to address the shortcomings, the criticism that this literature has faced and will continue to face. After all, I say research is incremental, and so I think we all learn from an open intellectual debate on this. Now, what do I mean for success? Um, I will basically concentrate on cases and episodes where uh, governments have been successful at reducing public debt to GDP ratios in a permanent way. So before showing you the ingredient for success, let me put it in a funny way, I would say, let me show you a couple of facts. Fact number one, if you look across a sample of 21 OECD countries from 1960 till 2019, you can use a particular rule, but there are many similar rules, and just identify a number of episodes of large multi-annual fiscal consolidations. In this exercise, I just point out to 52 of those. 
Among these, only about 40% of the cases were successfully at reducing permanently over a number of years, meaning, and substantially more at least than 5% of GDP, the debt to GDP ratios. In other cases, as you can see, the distribution is very wide, debt to GDP increased. Now, you can, staying away from definition, you can also look at this sample, episodes in which debt to GDP ratio declined substantially over a number of subsequent years. That's the distribution to the left. And then you can see that in terms of changes to the cyclically adjusted primary balance, again, you can have a variety of outcomes. It doesn't seem that public debt reduction episodes did necessarily require large fiscal adjustments year after year. The third fact that I want to uh, just highlight is that the macro outcomes were very different in so-called successful and unsuccessful episodes. And you get a variety of outcomes, both in terms of here you can see growth distributions and inflation distributions across these different two sets of episodes that I picked. You can see that uh, in the uh, left hand side, you have the distribution of real GDP growth and you can see that successful versus unsuccessful differed in terms of growth outcomes with long tails of the distributions in both cases, but certainly it seems that on average, and if you do some statistical tests, these distributions are different. The growth outlook was better in successful episodes than in unsuccessful ones. Obviously, these are just correlations, right? Maybe for other reasons, not because there were, you know, fiscal adjustments ongoing, growth might have been higher and that might have contributed to lower debt to GDP ratios. We don't know at this stage, but clearly there are, you know, successes are associated with better growth distributions and more benign inflation outcomes. Now, let me turn to, you know, what again, I, I can uh, joke and say the key ingredients for success or the road to success. I mean, there is a slide also on initial fiscal position, but I would say it's there are the, the, the differences are less striking. Uh, here, I will just, you know, uh, basically look at the difference between the size of this uh, reduction, deficit reduction, uh, and, uh, and the composition. In terms of the size, if you look both cumulatively over these episodes, if you look at the average over the years, yes, there seems to be that on average in the successful episodes, uh, the, the, the size of the adjustment was slightly smaller and was spread over a number of, over a longer time of, of, uh, of period. But again, if you do any statistical test on these averages, you don't find much of a difference. Instead, if you look at the bottom two panels and you look at the composition both on spending and tax items, you find some differences on average. And if I had plot the distribution, some of distributions are also statistically significant, statistically significantly different. Now, the chart on the left looks at different taxes. Here we have changes in taxes on labor, taxes on businesses and indirect taxes. Now you can see that in the unsuccess uh, you know, sample, uh, the majority of the tax increases were labor taxes and indirect taxes. Very little was done on business taxes. The opposite happened in the other two cases. If you look on the spending side here on average, you can see that in success, one sample, you have that basically both social benefits, government consumption and public investment were cut more or less by similar amounts, even though public investment by less than the other two items. If you look at the unsuccess sample, you can see that it was basically big cuts to government consumption and big cuts to government investment. Much, not much was done or, or seems to show on average to um, to the uh, public public benefit social benefits but one interesting feature is uh, uh, is really uh, you know what happens to interest rate expenses in particular it's obviously you know by definitions if their success they reduce the stock of debt so the interest rate expenses fall but this can also show and i think later charts that i will show you later that perhaps risk premium compressed much more when you were successful now, 
Another important ingredient that this literature has, uh, has uh, um, highlighted is uh, the uh, well. I'll, I'll get back. To, is the differences in the fiscal policy mix? Uh, I mean, uh, these fiscal adjustments rarely happen in isolation. I mean, they happened when uh, the situation was not great, and they were often associated also with other policies that were were happening at the same time. Now, if you look at the changes on average uh, of nominal short-term rates, real short-term rates, same for long-term rates, I think one interesting feature is that you can see that long-term rates, both nominal and real, decline uh, much more than, than short-term rates. And if you plot the distribution uh, of, of short, of long-term real and nominal rates, they are statistically different. The second types of policies are, you know, I took an indicator of product market liberalization, and it seems that in the successful episodes, you know, on average, uh, there was a larger, um, a larger decline in, uh, in regulation. Now, so to conclude, I would say that if we really want to treat this as a sort of like, uh, you know, cooking recipe, right? Obviously, the literature is much more, you know, articulated than this. Um, I would say that two, two key messages uh, for those who want to do research more and more in this, uh, on this area is that one, I mean, the composition of fiscal policy is important. I think we, we heard, uh, you know, again, it's, it's simplistic, I would say, to just speak about, you know, maybe very generally uh, about spending or, or changes or tax changes uh, without looking more in detail into it. But definitely, I've done work using many different rules, many different definitions, cutting the data in many different ways. And I think one message is that, you know, not just look at the size, but also look at how, you know, uh, successful versus unsuccessful episodes different could be, could be uh, important. Second, obviously, given how, uh, you know, how the tails of the distributions are, um, are, are long, um, this is, I think, a literature where really studying in detail very single episodes could be uh, could be quite important. Um, and um, the other point is that the policy mix is also very relevant. Now, let me go very quickly from uh, the past, I would say, to the future. And, uh, and let me just, you know, uh, look at what is happening in the euro area and what budget plan would, would basically su uh, suggest. I mean, one, uh, one key, uh, uh, I would say, um, uh, questions that we always get asked is whether, you know, public debt stabilization is, is not uh, challenging uh, for the coming years. And again, given uh, the growth outlook, uh, and uh, the increase in interest rate expenses, uh, I think it would be uh, quite optimistic to think that public debt to GDP ratios in high debt countries can decline without some sort of like fiscal adjustments. If we look at uh, what is happening within the euro area and in the budget of the various countries, I mean, uh, just focusing, for example, on the major EU4 countries, there is very little for the years to come in terms of proper underlining fiscal adjustment, but the deficit are likely to decline by countries not renewing and stopping energy subsidies measures that have been undertaken in, uh, in, in the past few years. Last but not least, and this goes a little bit to try to uh, look at, you know, the composition and getting back uh, to something that was uh, highlighted this morning. I mean, if we look at the changes uh, in the um, labor taxes versus business taxes, it seems that for the next two years, the countries have in their plans more increases in labor taxes than increases in business taxes. So based on history, this is uh, the half, the glass half uh, empty. But if you look at the government wage bill uh, on the first uh, phase, you can be awful. It seems that, you know, countries put in their, in their budget uh, cuts to these spending items. But the reality is, as someone was mentioning this morning, uh, I mean, Roberto mentioned, sorry, uh, these uh, this spending um, cuts episodes are not very frequent. And I think it's interesting to think that, I mean, I know, uh, for example, in the case of Italy, uh, public sector wage bill still has to increase. We know that, uh, you know, uh, public sector um, employees are, are not fired. 
uh, we know that they could retire, but obviously that would imply an increase in pension spending, which we don't see in, in the budget draft. Um, my last um, my last um, point is that at least you know with the NGU um, data at least uh, based on budget plans you know public investment seems to be safeguarded at least uh, on uh, on paper and so the majority of countries in the coming two years uh, are not planning any major cut into uh, government fixed um, capital formation. Um, perhaps I'll stop you here. Thanks. Thank you, Sylvia. I mean, I'm not sure if it's in your uh, your collection of episodes, but uh, my memory for, from the fiscal consolidations uh, in the Troika countries was, was the long-term interest rate was very important, but it's basically the replacement of market funding with official funding uh, at cheap interest rates uh, played some role there. But we may come back to that in the, the discussion. So let me uh, move to, to Roe. Thank you, Philip. Um, thanks for having me here. Um, let me start by um, looking at this figure from the uh, EFB annual report uh, of this year. Um, if we look at, um, at this figure, we see net expenditure growth. And if we look at the uh, very high debt countries, these are the countries uh, with 90% or more uh, debt as a ratio of GDP, then we see that uh, moving from 20 to 21, uh, we observe that actually net expenditure growth falls. But if we exclude temporary measures, so like corona measures, then actually we see that it increases and it uh, increases beyond uh, medium term potential growth. So what we've been pointing out is that uh, underlying expenditures are um, not very favorable in that uh, respect. So. I think it's important that uh, governments uh, agree on the reform, um, and uh, you know if that does not happen, then of course the the old rules uh, will apply. But the old rules they did not prove uh, very effective in in um, you know in, in getting uh, countries to be uh, disciplined. Um, so um, well, I, I'm at some distance, of course, to uh, you know what is going on in in you know in the negotiations. So let's see what what comes out of it. Um, I think that uh, um, you know the Commission had, I think, the um, in in November last year they had, uh, I think, a very good like um, how you say. Uh, um, you know proposals, and then there was, of course, the uh, legal proposal in um, in April this year. Um, but a number of elements were still unclear. And so, for example, in that proposal, the so-called compensation account was unclear. And I think now, looking at the most recent documents, the uh, compromise documents, so to say, by the uh, Spanish uh, presidency, there is uh, you know so these details have been filled in. Um, but with um, you know moving from the original proposal to uh, what it now looks like, of course there is also uh, you know a lot of complexity is added, and the question is whether this additional complexity, whether that um, you know um, is helpful in terms of credibility of the of the system. Um, and uh, I think that is that is key. Enforcement is uh, is key in the end, and. Um, for the uh, for the revised stability and growth pact, uh, that uh, you know the uh, it is important I think to to you know to apply this enforcement uh, early on, even if this is only through very very small fines. Um, then, um, as I was saying, things have become uh, well quite complicated. I think in the latest uh, documents, uh, has so. Um, you know, and then the question is, you know, when an EDP is opened, what is the role of uh, all the all the relevant factors, etc. Um, let me move on. Um, so there are a couple of worries um, or, or points that were made by the uh, by the European Fiscal Board. One is. Uh, there's the possibility for countries, uh, so they get, in principle, they get a four-year adjustment period, but this could be extended to uh, up to a maximum of seven years, and uh, this could be done then, you know, would be on the basis of investments and reforms that fulfill certain uh, certain conditions. Now, 
the question is whether this um, you know might also not in a way water down the enforcement based on the uh, numerical criteria so how will those investments and reforms be treated when there is a uh, a danger of a uh, of a debt based uh, excessive deficit procedure um one of the omissions in the uh, proposed uh, revision of the of the of the system is that there is no uh, central fiscal capacity um and um, in particular to fun finance uh, public goods, public European public goods, uh, you know, common investments. Um, so there have been also proposals for uh, green golden rules. Uh, we are uh, skeptical about this because of the danger of greenwashing, but also because if you want to assess sustainability, you would do that on the uh, complete uh, budget. And as European Fiscal Board, we also made some uh, you know proposals for uh, say an alternative um, and here i uh, quite recently i wrote a uh, proposal with with Age Bakker, uh, former executive director at the imf where we propose an eu fund to dedic dedicated to investments with cross-border benefits and each country would have an envelope within the fund that um, uh, and, and you know, as EFB, we have proposed uh, similar uh, solutions in, in our annual reports. Now, conditional on adherence to the fiscal rules, then countries would be able to draw resources from the fund uh, but for investments. But those investments should have uh, positive externalities across borders. Um, and if countries would fail to come up with good plans or adhere to the fiscal rules, then the remainder in their envelope would be redistributed over the other envelope. So such a fund, and it would really be a fund, it would not be in the EU budget because the EU budget would be kind of a status quo and uh, countries would, you know, some countries would feel that, you know, you would never be able to, to shrink the budget. So, but um, such a type of fund, you know, could have the you know the role of of a central fiscal capacity and it would have two benefits it would have an incentive would provide for an incentive to uh, for this fiscal discipline because countries would need to adhere to the rules to make use of the of the of the uh, resources and it would encourage investments with a public good character so in any case it's important uh, we believe that it's important that you know Countries will think about uh, central fiscal capacity, even though at the current moment it's not, uh, you know, the political uh, climate is not very favorable for that, at least on some sides of the uh, of the Euro of the EU. Um, I, there's one last thing I want to discuss. Um, so I was talking about public investment, but I think also, uh, you know, this uh, this the, you know the importance of private investments. Um, yeah, there's a huge need for investments in digital uh, transition, but also in the energy transition. And if we look further ahead, then um, you know, with the increase in the uh, fraction of retirees in the in the population, you would uh, I would expect that aggregate savings will fall, and uh, and so there would be basically there would be fewer savings for more investment needs. And so. Um, uh, it's it's very important that the uh, capital markets union uh, gets completed. The capital markets union is, of course, it's complicated because it consists of many, many, you know, in a way smaller items. But it is essential because um, uh, savings, uh, potentially a decrease in savings, would need to be channeled to those places where they where they contribute uh, most. So let me stop here at the end, Thank you. Thank, thank you, Earl. And let me hand over to Valdis. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Philip, and thank you uh, for the invitation to this uh, uh, conference. So, well, uh, first of all, uh, uh, obviously, we need to tackle the uh, short-term uh, challenges which we are uh, facing in a uh, context of uh, post-COVID uh, pandemic and uh, Russia's war uh, in Ukraine, and as a result, uh, European economic uh, uh, slowdown. But uh, at the same time, it's uh, also clear that Euro area economy is uh, facing a number of uh, structural challenges, 
uh, low productivity growth, uh, population aging, uh, uh, changing and more conflictual geopolitical context, uh, the twin transitions, green and digital transition. Mm -hmm. uh, and with all that, uh, potential growth is expected to fall. Uh, so we expect euro areas uh, potential output growth uh, rate to fall back from around 1.4% over the next two years to an average rate of nearly 1% over the medium uh, term. Uh, so we need to address our structural challenges to bring growth back to a higher uh, level and improve the resilience of the euro area. And in this, we see uh, four main uh, priority areas of work for the Economic and Monetary Union. Uh, support productivity enhancing investments and structural reforms, uh, assert our open uh, strategic autonomy while staying open uh, to trade and foreign investment, uh, complete the banking union and further deepen the capital markets union, uh, and uh, continue with a sound macroeconomic uh, policy. So let me go through those uh, topics. So first on supporting investments and uh, uh, reforms. Uh, it's uh, very clear uh, tackling the structural challenges in a durable manner will need both investments and structural reforms. And uh, Next Generation EU and specifically uh, Recovery and Resilience uh, Facility uh, are a powerful uh, new instruments uh, to do uh, this, especially in uh, key EU priority areas. So, uh, European uh, Commission uh, simulations indicate that impact of uh, fiscal and public investment supported by uh, next generation EU could increase EU's uh, GDP by up to 1.5% during the years of next generation EU active implementation. Uh, and if it's coupled with reforms in market uh, competition and regulation, taxation, skills and education, labor markets, research and developments, they could raise EU's GDP by around 2% in five years and 8% in uh, 20 years. And in the context where uh, higher rates are affecting debt sustainability, uh, Next Generation EU has provided a, a respite for public finances and supported growth, especially in member states uh, which have more limited fiscal space. Uh, and it's also boosting confidence in the euro area, uh, which itself is a positive uh, impact on financing uh, conditions. Uh, on the second point, on open uh, strategic uh, autonomy, with more security and geopolitical risks, the EU needs to defend its uh, interest. Uh, at the same time, we need to remain uh, open to trade and foreign investment, because trade provides for new markets and economies of uh, uh, scales. Uh, it gives companies access to uh, best uh, inputs and most advanced uh, technologies uh, and allows EU companies to diversify their sources of supply. And uh, it's worth noting that in the next decade, 90% of global growth will take place outside the EU. So we need to be connected to this uh, economic, uh, uh, this uh, outside source of economic growth and use uh, opportunities is uh, uh, provide. So trade and investment are key for connecting Europe to these uh, sources of productivity and, G, uh, G, uh, medium and GDP growth in medium to long uh, 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 term. So uh, it's uh, clear that in a sense we cannot turn inwards because then we'll be locking ourselves out of those uh, opportunities. Well, on banking union, uh, capital markets union, uh, I think that's a topic which is uh, much uh, discussed and well uh, known, but uh, those are uh, remaining uh, core pillars of the Commission's economic and monetary union uh, agenda. Uh, and uh, the investments that were required to boost our growth uh, potential will have to come primarily from private uh, sector. Uh, uh, the amounts are very sizable for public uh, sector to uh, uh, cover it, so ensuring sufficient capacity of the private sector uh, will require a movement uh, uh, with the banking union and capital markets union. Actually, it's the most cost-effective step we can uh, uh, take. Uh, 
and this will unlock, unlock growth potential by uh, promoting uh, also cross-border capital flows and more efficient allocation of uh, uh, resources. Uh, then on uh, sound uh, macroeconomic uh, uh, policies, um, the public sector obviously can also improve the resilience of EMU by providing EU public goods, uh, delivering the, the appropriate level of macroeconomic stabilization and ensuring debt sustainability. So uh, indeed, uh, also today we heard discussions about uh, central uh, fiscal capacity as means of uh, directly financing EU uh, public uh, uh, goods. Well, at, at this stage, the multi-annual financial framework and next generation EU uh, for, fulfills this role for years uh, to come, as I was just uh, mentioning, and it was actually a major step for member states to take. Uh, well, the jump to uh, permanent centralized fiscal capacity would be more uh, controversial, however. Uh, we know that a number of member states agreed to the next generation EU, uh, clearly on a condition that it's a one-off uh, instrument. So uh, clearly uh, this will require uh, further uh, discussions on what comes on the next uh, uh, financing uh, uh, cycle. But uh, in the meantime, the most uh, uh, urgent is now to agree on the reform of EU uh, fiscal rules. Uh, 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 again, there has been already discussions of European Commission's proposal in this uh, regard. So uh, basically what we aim is to increase national uh, ownership with more tailor-made uh, fiscal adjustment paths, uh, achieve more uh, granular, uh, realistic, but steadier uh, reduction in debt uh, levels, uh, and boost investments and reforms through uh, the incentive of lower annual adjustment for member states committing to growth enhancing reforms and uh, investments. Uh, so uh, this should go a long way to help governments to better prioritize spending in the direction of EU common priorities uh, and improve the quality and composition of uh, public uh, uh, finances. Um, well, uh, these improvements will be uh, needed because uh, very high public debt levels remain a source of concern in the EU uh, in the context of EMU, uh, and uh, public debt challenges have certainly increased in uh, recent years due to uh, res uh, fiscal response to COVID-19 uh, pandemic and energy crisis, and the following increase in uh, interest uh, uh, rates. Uh, and there are also uh, structural trends, uh, trends which will wait on uh, public finances like population uh, aging, uh, less benign differential uh, between nominal growth and interest rates, and large additional uh, investment needs in the context of green and digital uh, 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 transitions. So, so we uh, urgently need to make uh, progress on the new EU uh, fiscal uh, rules and uh, considerable eff uh, effort has been uh, made on uh, this, and I believe that we are close to finalization of this. The uh, Spanish presidency has uh, convened an ad hoc ECOFIN video conference for 20th of December in two days, so hopefully we can finalize uh, those uh, uh, discussions uh, there. So to conclude, the EMU uh, needs to become uh, more resilient, which means increasing uh, potential growth keeping public finances under control and further strengthening the institutional architecture. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Valdis. That's very wide ranging and no doubt we'll come back to a lot of that in the discussion, but, but let me turn to, to Jeremy. Uh, great, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, so. I thought I could most usefully use my seven minutes to give you a sense of where the exists where the uh, fiscal governance review stands as as far as as I'm aware and what what I and my co-authors who, who have been doing work on this for about the last half year or so uh, where where we you know how, what we think of it um so to remind you of the original idea this is going to be was supposed to be very different from the existing uh, set of fiscal rules. It was uh, supposed to be a risk-based, country-specific system uh, based on the European Commission's debt sustainability analysis, which has a probabilistic element, like 
Olivier um, mentioned, and, and of course the th three percent benchmark uh, um, deficit cap, because that's uh, in the treaty. We can do nothing about that. Uh, there is also importantly the idea that uh, investment is encouraged, uh, reforms are encouraged, and depending on the quality of your investment reforms plans, you may get an additional three years to adjust your finances to the level that would meet the DSA and the 3% uh, requirements. There's a little bit of a restriction on your speed of adjustment within the seven year period, but not a very heavy restriction. So it basically was a, a very flexible system, very much country specific, very DSA based. And the main argument for this is that because our enforcement limits are so tight uh, in the fiscal area, in the EU, uh, the fiscal area being, as far as I know, the only area that is explicitly taken off the table for the purposes of uh, implying the treaty infringement procedure, which is our usual way of enforcing EU rules uh, and fines not really being plausible in a peer group, there isn't very much we can do uh, on the enforcement side. So if we want to improve compliance, it has to be by making essentially countries voluntarily do the right thing, and we're not going to make them do the right thing if we impose a system of, of rules to them that make no sense for their specific economic case. So that's the argument for the, the ownership argument for the proposed uh, reform. And then there's the idea that the reform should also um, uh, 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 contain incentives for structural reform that includes growth. So it's not just about austerity, it's also about about the denominator um, of the debt to GDP ratio. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, of course, the nice thing about having a seven year adjustment period is that it makes adjustments from very large deficit positions, which is what we have today in about a uh, half dozen countries feasible. So a whole lot of, of good things about, about this plan. Now, the main worry, the main objection to the plan, which I, I shared when it came out, is that this gives the commission a lot of discretion. Uh, and as such uh, potential rooms for political games or for, for you know, sub being subjected to political pressure. And the, the reason for that is that only the Commission really understands their uh, debt sustainability analysis. And in that sense, maybe discretion can be abused in a system that's mainly DSA based. And so this uh, then led to this um, demand for the so-called safeguards, which are essentially back to the old system, simple rules guaranteeing minimum adjustment. Uh, the Commission themselves proposed such safeguards in their April legislative proposal. They were introduced at the last minute, mostly, I think, in, res in uh, response to German pressure. They were not very well designed in the April proposal. We, we published sort of some of the more weird implications of these safeguards in a paper in, in September. And since then, uh, essentially, the Council has been negotiating these safeguards in a way that would satisfy both sides. So give the conservative half of, of Europe some uh, some solace, some, some comfort, while not creating restrictions that would create an unreasonable fiscal adjustment pressure for the other half. And so where we have come down now is, is a debt safeguard that dictates a minim, minimum average speed of debt decline of 1% for the high debt countries and of half a percent of GDP per year on average for the countries between 60 and 90% of debts over four years. So this was a, um, a great German success. Um, the, the commission uh, draft said it should be flat uh, over four years. But, and this is the important thing, if you are in the excessive deficit procedure, the starting point is shifted until you come out of the EDP, right? So the main problem of the Commission's original draft was that it is practically unavoidable if you start out with a large deficit to see your debt go up for a while while you're financing this deficit. So then to require the debt to come down, or at least not to be higher after four years at the beginning, would have required ridiculous austerity. Uh, and so this uh, is the way in which this uh, problem is avoided. So this is based on a Franco-German compromise, and you can exactly see where the you know, German bit of the compromise is and the French bit of the compromise. So it's a, it's a masterful political uh, compromise. Now, there's another thing that was introduced much more recently called a debt resilience safeguard. And, and the idea here is that you know, the plan of the Commission to dictate a return to no more than 3% deficit within four to seven years is not ambitious enough with respect to the deficit benchmark because you really want to aim higher, I mean more ambitious, so that in the 10 years after the um, 
the adjustment period, you have some buffer in case there are bad shocks to not go back over the 3%. And indeed, in our September paper, we've made some simulations that show that the probability that uh, countries would go back over 3%, given the normal uncertainty that underlies also the DSA, was, was quite high. So I don't know whether we planted this idea or not. But now the idea is, you know, you shouldn't just go for the 3%, go for a safety margin. And in the end, the safety margin is one and a half points of GDP. So these are the two main safeguards. Now, our, our take on this discussion is that the, the, the worry that, you know, there's too much discretion is indeed valid, but the post remedy, which is to essentially go back to some version of the old system, which is based on simple rules, could undermine the purpose of the reform, right? And this is what we want to get away from. And so a better approach, if you're suspicious of the commission, is open the black box of the DSA, arguably do some reforms, have everyone own it, and make it fully transparent, then no one can cheat. And, and so we, we actually contributed to that by, by uh, uh, replicating the methodology and, and people can now download it from our website if, uh, if they want to. And the commission was ex extremely collaborative with us. They didn't give us the methodology, but we basically spent three months in a trial and error um, sort of loop. You know, we think you're doing this. Uh, not quite right. Check that part. And this went on for like about 25 iterations. And finally, we essentially replicated the results and then they stopped telling us to do things differently. But they were very collaborative. I mean, they did exactly what international civil servants are supposed to do. They collaborated within their, their rules. Okay, now the big point is, even though I, I disagree with this approach, uh, philosophically, the safeguards approach, it makes a big difference whether you design safeguards in a way that would, in some sense, obstruct the DSA results or not. Right, so so the the, the analogy which I uh, I've I've come to use is that safeguards should be like guardrails on a road, so they shouldn't restrict traffic. They should not you should not bump into them as a car as long as you drive in a civilized manner the way you're supposed to drive. Right, that's the DSA. You're supposed to adjust. You're supposed to drive down that road in a particular manner. Now, if you deviate, you know, if you get drunk. If there's an accident, if there's a shock, and you go, you know, you're about to go off the road, then the safeguard's supposed to catch you, right? So the ex ante safeguard should not be binding. So the question is, at least in the first application, would they be binding, right? And so these are the implications of the new uh, framework. I'll show you the quantitative results in a, in a second. So the good news is that for the most part, the way the safeguards have not now been designed makes them not binding, not completely. In some cases, they are binding in the initial for to seven year adjustment period. So the framework has not completely lost its soul because of these safeguards. That's the good news. Now the bad news, at least if you are sort of worried that there will be too much austerity, is actually the DSA itself is really tough. Uh, much tougher than I expected, much tougher than probably the Germans expected at, at the beginning. It does require very large adjustments for high debt countries, and this has to do with a couple of technical features of the DSA, which, which are debatable. I think they, they can be justified, they're reasonable, but they're debatable, and so that debate probably should, should happen. The other piece of bad news is that this deficit resilience safeguard basically says if you, if you emerge from the four to seven years adjustment period and you are not yet at a, a deficit that is, you know, at 1.5% or lower, you have to keep going outside the adjustment period. And because you have to keep going in a way that offsets a, a, a higher cost of aging that are projected during this period, it makes, it, it, and of course, at, at the same time, the higher interest rates that are now in the pipeline are being rolled into the debt stop. You have to keep going quite far in some cases. And so, as I'll show you in a sense, in some countries, this leads to absurdly high uh, structural balance, primary balance targets outside the actual adjustment period. And then the final complaint is that the frame, framework is not very friendly to, to green public investment in the sense that it creates barriers to an investment push, even if the investment would be okay from a DSA perspective. So just like Ruhl, I firmly believe that debt is debt. And like my Minister of Finance, Christian Lindner, debt is debt. It has to be repaid, doesn't matter where the debt comes from. But, you know, put it in the DSA. But do not make it subject to these artificial barriers that have no economic justification, right? So, and unfortunately, the system would, would do that. So I have two more slides. They're both about numbers. So, so the, this is sort of the summary of, of the implications of the fiscal framework. So the first three columns are the current, sort of the November European uh, Commission forecast for 2024, debt, fiscal balance, 
structural primary balance. So you see there's a very wide range on the fiscal and the SBB. You know, some countries are way in excess deficits. Other countries like uh, Greece, Portugal, uh, Cyprus, so essentially the former crisis countries that, that found religion uh, fiscally after uh, the crisis, they are in, in surpluses or have, they have a very strong uh, positions. Now, columns four and five tell you the structural primary balances required by the end of the four or seven year adjustment period, according to the rules of the DSA and the 3%. So columns four and five, in a sense, you can interpret it. This would, would have been the result if the commission had gotten its way in the November proposal. And you see that these are very high numbers in some cases. Italy, over 3%. Right, so actually, primary balance over, over 3%. Remember that sort of the high watermark of structural primary balances requirements was the discussion with, with Greece and its official creditors, where the uh, Eurogroup in the end uh, uh, settled on 2.3% as sort of the long-term structural primary balance target for Greece. This is considerably above the, that. Spain is in about the same range. Belgium is in about the same range. Portugal is in about the same range. Now, for a country like Portugal, it doesn't matter because they're already there. In a country like Greece, they're actually over, their, above their required uh, structural primary balance in, in 10 years. Now, wh why is this so high? The, the main point, as I said, is that the commission methodology requires countries to anticipate and offset increasing aging costs over the 10 years after the adjustment period is over. And, and for most parts, they, they will go up quite a lot in that. And that is something, for example, that is essentially a, a judgment call, right? I mean, you can say, well, countries will deal with aging costs in some way when they get there, either by making additional adjustment or through structural reforms. And so, you know, the standard IMF DSA, for example, would not put them in. The Commission follows a tradition that I think comes from the MTO of forcing countries to pre-finance those aging costs. Now, to be fair, of course, what countries can do is they come up, can come up with a medium-term stru fiscal structural plan, which is what they're supposed to under the system, where they say, look, Commission, your assumptions about aging costs in our country are all wrong because we actually plan to do such and such reforms on aging over the four to seven year period, then they would not have to do this austerity, right? So the way to justify this commission approach is, is to say it's a very strong incentive to address aging costs in some way during that, but not necessarily in, through f fiscal adjustment. Okay, so, so the bottom line is, is four and five is, is pretty tough, columns four and five. Now columns six and seven show you how much these safeguards add, right? And so the, the, whenever it's, there's no highlight, it means that it's the same, so the safeguards are not binding. And then the four cases that I've highlighted, they, they are binding. And then the color says which safeguard is binding. So the debt safeguard is binding only in two cases, Spain and Portugal, uh, Finland, I'm sorry, for the four-year period. The deficit safeguard, not surprisingly, is binding in, in Greece. And then Finland in the seven-year period and Cyprus uh, in the seven-year uh, period. And so that makes quite a big difference, particularly for Greece, right? Uh, also uh, for Finland. Now. The uh, overall impact then on adjustment needs is given in, in the next two columns. So what I've done here is essentially just subtracted the primary balance targets from column six and seven uh, from the, or vice versa, the, the starting point in column three from the end point in column six and seven, and then by, divided by the number of years. So this shows you sort of the average adjustment that would be required over the, in the first application of the plan. And the bottom line is that in, in, in many, if this were a four year period, in many cases, it, it's, it looks unfeasible, right? So Italy over 1%, Belgium over 1%, France close to 0.9. Um, but once you move to the seven-year period, it, you know, the seven-year period does what it's supposed to do, namely to bring down the average adjustment to perhaps more feasible levels. So for the most part, they're in the order of you know, between 0.2 and 0.5, and then we have a few cases that are slightly higher, Italy and, and Belgium. Then finally, the 10, so, so basically the overall verdict is based on column nine is that this doesn't look completely absurd, right? It's going to be a tough adjustment over a substantial period, but it does not look uh, unfeasible to me. And of course, if you buy the DSA, you would say in most cases, this is necessary. In some cases, there's an unnecessary element piled on top, which comes from the safeguards. Now, the final two columns give you, give you the, the, the yellow shaded stuff 
denotes cases where in order to reach this final target of getting deficits durably, durably below 1.5%, countries have to do even more than they have to do within those four to seven years. And so that gives an additional adjustment need in the cases of, of Greece, Italy, France, Spain for the seven year period and, and Belgium. Now, in most cases, it's not a whole lot more than they need to do within the adjustment period, but there are two exceptions, and though that's Italy and, and France. So in Italy, if, if they get the seven year extension, which for sure they will get, then in principle, they would have to, after this seven year period, continue raising their surpluses until they get to over 5% structural primary balance, right? Which seems implausible to me. For France, they're in a more plausible range, 2.2, 2.6, but it's much more than they have to do within the adjustment period. So again, the plausibility of this is unclear. So it, it is, in my, my view, countries who agree to this reform, basically maybe they agree to the first part of the reform, the first four to seven years in good faith, I cannot imagine that any, you know, France or Italy would agree uh, to this extended period of austerity beyond, beyond the, the, the four to seven year period. Okay, the final point, you uh, cannot really see much of this slide. The, 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 point, the, the point of this slide is to show you the def, debt and deficit consequences of a temporary rise in investment during the seven year adjustment period. So this is an experiment where countries would raise investment by 0.5% uh, of GDP beyond current projections over six years. At the same time, they would raise their structural primary balance at the end of the seven year period to ensure that both the DSA requirements, the 3% reference, and indeed even the deficit resilience safeguards are met. And so the main insight here is that between the baseline scenario, which is the continuous line, and the and the dotted scenario, which is the in investment uh, uh, um, experiment. And so the, the blue lines is the debt path. So just look at the debt path of the, the broken blue, blue line and compare it to the solid blue line. There is a very small difference. So from the point of debt sustainability, this type of strategy makes almost no, or not from the point of debt sustainability, from the point of debt decline. If you really, what you want is debt decline, you're taking the, treaty very literally, you could not object to this. Neither could you object to this by construction if you worry about debt sustainability, because that's how we have cooked these numbers. They satisfy all the debt sustainability requirements. Yet, you could not do this under the current plan. And the reason why you couldn't do this experiment is because, by definition, it would, meet, it would violate the so-called so no backloading condition under the, uh, the compromise, because you, end, you start with, you know, you do a combination of, of steady fiscal adjustment in the non-investment budget, but then the investment budget has a high deficit. And then you take it back right at the end. So it looks like there's backloading of fiscal adjustment. It violates the no backloading condition. And of course, in some cases, the, the, the debt decline is delayed. And so the debt safeguard is also violated. And, and this is sort of what really bothers me about the current, uh, the current approach. It, that could have been a very easy way of dealing with this. And it it was not uh, it was not done. Th th thank you, Chairman. So we we've covered a, a huge uh, r range of uh, timelines uh, and topics in in, in in this opening part, but really to, to sharpen some of the issues uh, uh, before I open it to the floor, um, I have a couple of questions for each, each panel member. So Sylvia, uh, I mean a lot of what Chairman just just mentioned there is country by country analysis. But we also have to think of the year area fiscal stance in the aggregate. Um, so, so when you look at, at the near term, let's say the next couple of years, uh, when you look at the year area as an aggregate for the fiscal stance and also the fiscal monetary mix, uh, do you, I mean, what do you think of, of the, the uh, where collectively the European fiscal uh, position should be going? And then maybe second, taking advantage of your kind of markets role. Uh, what have we learned so far from uh, how next generation the EU is being financed uh, to, to the issue of, uh, of uh, the supranational bonds? So, Sylvia, if you have any uh, insights in either of those. Thank you, Phil. 
So to your first question on the uh, euro area uh, aggregate fiscal stance, I mean, when we look at uh, the uh, you know the, the the draft budget of the various countries, we assess them, and in particular, we focus on the four, and we sort of like took that as a sort of like big picture. Um, you know, for for the euro area fiscal stance, we basically, um, as I was saying, beginning see it uh, almost neutral to slightly fiscally fiscal res slightly restrictive in the next uh, two years. I mean, of the tune of like uh, reducing growth by uh, 10, 20 basis points every year, and that's a combination of uh, the nature of measures that are uh, in the budgets. Uh, and the uh, multiplier that we apply to those measures. So um, on uh, on uh, what should uh, the proper uh, fiscal and monetary policy mix? Again, I'm sure in this room there are uh, people who are much more qualified than I am to, to give this, but the way I think uh, to it is the following. One, when I think about the fiscal um, position of countries and the euro area as a whole, I really think that, uh, in a sense, one size does not fit all, right? There are, uh, I think, at the euro area level, on average, we know that the deficit is uh, pretty low. It's converging, you know, uh, it's declining, and uh, the, the average debt to GDP ratio is also much lower than what we have in the US or or in the UK or or in Japan, for the like. But then we have some countries that have a very high uh, debt to GDP ratio. I think when I read the literature. Uh, for me, when we think about the need of fiscal uh, adjustments or reducing the debt to GDP ratio, it's really more to uh, create, recreate, reobtain fiscal space is more and so have an instrument that we can use um, in, in time of needs. Uh, it's more to avoid fiscal crisis rather than honestly thinking about uh, the impact on uh, fiscal policy, uh, for example, on inflation. I think, again, both the IMF work, both the work that uh, Olivier was mentioning before on, on the energy measures, but also some excellent work have done here at DCB on that really shows that, you know, we had expansionary fiscal measures last year, but they contributed to lower inflation, not to, to increase inflation directly through moderating energy prices and indirectly through avoiding second rounds effect on wages. So again, there I would say, look, uh, the composition, the, the changes in this instrument is important. On the monetary policy uh, stance, again, our own view is that, I mean, we share the fact that monetary policy is restrictive, even very restrictive. And uh, I mean, the, the view from, from us in uh, at Barclays and, uh, you know, the market is that uh, it will become much less restrictive or, or uh, you know, it will converge toward neutral in the next uh, uh, year or, or so. And, uh, and so in terms of mix, I think that's... Uh, um, where I think, you know, the way the way I think of the interaction of these two policies um, for the next two years. Um, now, uh, obviously, there are always risks, right? <laughs> and, uh, um, but, and, and unforeseen events. Um, now, on, on your second uh, questions on, on the NGU uh, bonds, uh, what do we hear? I mean, just for those who are not perhaps in, um, in the weeds, um, I mean, when we uh, one way to track the performances of these bonds is obviously to compare the yield at different maturities vis-a-vis -vis the yield of Germany, the yield of French bonds, um, and in uh, you know the the NGU and EU bonds um, are trading at the premium relative to French bonds. So even though the rating is uh, is better <laughs> relative to the French bonds, they trade at the premium. And when I talk to investors, things that are usually point out are the following. One, uh, this can be seen as a liquidity premium. After all, the market is smaller. Uh, two, the uncertainty or the fact actually that these are seen still as temporary instruments, right, is something that um, uh, impact on the liquidity, impact on the uh, on the, on the way in which investors assess the, the these bonds. And then there are a, a, a variety of, uh, I would say, structural factors, micro structural factors that have to do with the markets, which is, you know, the absence, for example, of future markets, repo markets are important. And so, the, the way in which they are used as a collateral. So these are all factors that I think are important for investors. Okay. Th th thank you, Sylvia. So, so Ro, um, I mean, we, we've heard it in, the, in this session, but also uh, in Olivier's keynote, that 
it's very important for any kind of fiscal adjustment that is national ownership. And uh, I think it's identified, and we now have a, quite a number of years of track record in, in relation to the role of independent fiscal councils and indeed the European Fiscal Board. But of course, on, under the new framework, uh, to, to, to reap the benefits, and I suppose this partly goes to the safe, the guardrail issue that the chairman uh, raised, um, what is your assessment? I mean, this question of what should be the, the way the world is and then what will be the world that we live in. And including in that it is basically, uh, do these councils have the resources? Are they sufficiently, truly independent f f from the uh, fiscal authority? And uh, what what are the conditions needed to make to make them uh, effective? Because what I see is I see huge variation across Europe. Um, I mean, I think, personally speaking, the European Fiscal Board has been a, a, a real success. Uh, but, but and uh, I won't ask you to comment on yourself. Uh, but but uh, as far as you can, uh, on, on a forward-looking basis, uh, I mean, uh, there's a, a lot of weight has been put on these institutions. But you tell me what's needed to, to for them to deliver. Okay, thank you, thank you, Philip. Um, on the uh, independent fiscal institutions, um, I think the November last year communication by the Commission was actually, I think they had great ambitions with the IFIs. Yeah? So, for example, now they are responsible for um, consenting or producing the macroeconomic forecast. Um, I think in the communication, the idea was to extend this to uh, also to, to budgetary uh, forecasts, um, or maybe this was in any case this was also in the uh, in the legislative proposal, if I remember correctly, the one from from April. Now, when I now look at um, at the uh, you know the the Spanish compromise text, then I see that a lot of ambition has has gone. Yeah? So the basically regarding the IFIs, I. It's my impression that we are back at where we started. Eh? So with the current, uh, with the current, uh, uh, current roles, maybe a little bit of an extension, but substantially less than what was envisaged, envisaged originally. And I think that is it's it's a pity because um, you know one of the essential elements of the proposed reform is of course the increase in ownership. Now one element of ownership is that uh, after a technical trajectory uh, proposed by the commission then country can uh, you know will come up with its uh, you know fiscal structural plan and uh, so that will be of its own design and that of course uh, you know since it is its own uh, plan it is easier to hold it accountable but then um, and another element important element of the ownership would be uh, the role of the independent fiscal institutions, but here, as I said, the um, you know the the ambition has gone down relative to what was originally proposed. Now, uh, why is that? Um, well, <laughs> it's um, I think unfortunately um, you know you never love your critics, and so I think uh, ministries of finance. Um, well, I mean these IFIs, they of course they scrutinize the work of the government, of the ministries of finance, and of course, um, and they may criticize their work. And of course, that is, um, you know, they may not be very fond of this. So um, clearly, um, and I think that was also clear in the, I think in the March ECOFIN conclusions that uh, the ministries of finance didn't want, uh, you know, much bigger role for the independent fiscal institutions. Now, and that that is a pity because even uh, countries which, you know, the so-called very disciplined countries, even they are not very much in favor of strengthening these uh, independent fiscal institutions. And um, I think it's a, it's a, so so that is a that is a pity because, uh, say, if you take a very disciplined country, then uh, you know it would be. Uh, of course, it's you know upgrading its own IFI may lead to more you know scrutinizing of its its policies. But of course, if you do that in the entire uh, EU, then you would uh, you know you, as a disciplined country you would benefit from more discipline elsewhere. And 
So I think in a way, um, you know, governments have been uh, short-sighted in that respect. Now, of course, when it comes to, uh, you know, to resources and so on, uh, the IFIs, uh, there have been surveys among IFIs and generally for the current tasks, they, uh, most of them have enough resources and, uh, you know, independence, but there are always some that are uh, struggling. Yeah? So, um, so I think that it would be useful to have, uh, and there has been a lot of discussion about minimum standards uh, regarding uh, resources, regarding access and ti uh, timely access to to information, etc. Um, so, um, and um, I think they also um, in their position papers they also complain a little bit about the fact that. Uh, well, in a way, there is so when you so the the commission, of course, uh, scrutinizes fiscal policies, but then there are also the national IFIs, and um, there's not necessarily co coordination between the two. So it sometimes happens that uh, the commission gives a verdict, but then you know what is what is the role of the IFI in the discussion? And so I think ideally you would have the IFI which knows. A lot more, I think, about the details of the economic situation and the political situation in the country. Ideally, they would give input to the commission, and then the commission should be able to uh, to make its uh, assess assessment using these uh, these inputs. Um, of course, the European semester is very packed, so it is a challenge to uh, you know just time-wise to 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 accomplish that. But I think you know, that would be the ideal uh, situation. On the European Fiscal Board, um, well, being member of the European Fiscal Board, I think I cannot say too much, but I think one uh, a role is envisaged to increase, at least in these latest uh, proposals, uh, you know, written down by the Spanish presidency. So we would have uh, a role for, uh, you know, in the general escape clause. Um, I could imagine that the European Fiscal Board could also uh, say something about the on these fiscal structural structural plans, but then in a horizontal, how you say, you know, a comparison of the plans across countries. Eh? So that is also what we do uh, now. We compare in a horizontal way how the Commission applies the uh, applies the rule. So that could be a, a potential uh, role for the uh, for the EFB. But other than that, I you know let other people uh, speak about the EFB. Thank you. Thank you. So. Uh... Uh, let me turn to Valdis, who is an incredibly uh, busy person, because not only uh, has he many other portfolios, but he also has the trade portfolio of the Commission. And you would occasionally see him in the uh, media all over the world, all over the world, uh, negotiating uh, for the for us uh, in different settings. And you talked about open street autonomy. You talked about the fact that most of the growth in the world economy is going to be external. So I think this raises two questions. Um, uh, one is indeed... Uh, how you see uh, trade relations uh, between the EU and some of the other major regions of the world, such as China and the Middle East. And then second is for uh, autonomy, uh, whether we, we should rely more on domestic demand, because uh, external demand uh, can be kind of subject to that geopolitical risk. And then, of course, if we need to rely on domestic demand, had how that connects to, to the fiscal topic. Uh, so whether that's uh, national fiscal policies or a or common uh, fiscal policy. So, so Valdis, I don't know if you can, you can take on any or that of some, some subset of what I just asked you. Yeah, uh, thank you uh, very much uh, for this question. Well, uh, first of all, uh, it's uh, uh, true that uh, trade and uh, geopolitics is uh, now more uh, entangled. Uh, and it's something which we have seen in recent years, like by certain coercive uh, economic coercion policies uh, taken by China or by Russia's weaponization of uh, energy supplies, which we had to deal with uh, uh, last year, or now by uh, export controls uh, being introduced by uh, China and US, and there may be some proliferation of uh, this. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we must uh, remember that trade is a key driver of our uh, innovation and economic growth around uh, 
20% uh, uh, of the jobs in the EU, well, almost 20, something like 18% are uh, uh, linked with uh, our uh, exports and uh, uh, open markets ensure the global uh, competitive position in the EU. Uh, also, uh, increases in openness are associated with higher productivity growth. So, uh, OECD uh, estimates that uh, one percentage point raise in uh, trade openness, so uh, measured as uh, exports plus imports as a share of GDP, uh, raises multi-factor productivity by uh, 0.2% uh, after five years and 0.6% in a uh, long run. So uh, it's uh, uh, it's uh, vital for productivity and also it's worth noting that EU is not resource rich. So we need trade and investments to secure access to raw materials, uh, especially now in a context of green and digital uh, uh, transitions. So uh, openness to trade and uh, international cooperation are uh, vital uh, to diversify sources of supply and addressing global uh, uh, supply chain uh, vulnerabilities. So, uh, uh, but of course, uh, we see that the uh, paradigm is uh, shifting and there is more shift uh, of the paradigm from efficiency to resilience but it's coming at the cost. So higher import prices, uh, segmented markets, uh, diminished access to technology, uh, and ultimately reduced uh, productivity. So there are uh, estimates on macroeconomic impacts of trade uh, fragmentation. So uh, global trade fragmentation in form of increased trade barriers and higher trade policy uncertainty uh, uh, can lead to 5 to 7 percent reduction in uh, global output in long uh, term. If it's uh, uh, coupled with, uh, coupled well with, if, if we add uh, technological decoupling, uh, uh, then uh, losses can go up to 12 percent of GDP in long term. And on top of this, according to uh, IMF, fragmentation of capital flows like FDIs. Uh, uh, could also uh, uh, add costs in the range of 2% of GDP. And on FDI flows, it's something we are actually already starting to uh, to see. Uh, so, uh, uh, so as you see from those figures, uh, for euro area, it's difficult to imagine that increased internal demand can uh, fully compensate for the losses uh, uh, th what, uh, that would come from uh, trade uh, fragmentation. So... Um, so, uh, 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 of, of course, it does, does, does not diminish the fact that uh, uh, we, we need to carry out investments uh, to uh, boost uh, competitiveness and to boost uh, uh, domestic demand, but uh, clearly it cannot uh, compensate from uh, loss uh, of, uh, of global trading uh, system. So uh, maybe uh, coming uh, to um, uh, questions you raised with uh, some uh, specific uh, trading uh, partners, what is our approach? Like uh, with uh, China, as you know, we have a complex uh, policy uh, relationship where we see them as a cooperation partner, economic competitor and strategic rival. So there are areas where we need to cooperate with uh, China, like on climate change. Uh, China is the world's uh, biggest emitter. So if we want to deal with climate change, we need to deal with China. Uh, WTO reform to preserve a uh, rules-based international trading system. On economic uh, competitor, uh, China is our second biggest trading partner, but trade is very imbalanced. So last year, our trade deficit with China was almost 400 billion euros. So we're now working and also uh, reaching out to China actively to address some market access barriers in China to, to address this. Uh, and well, uh, systemic rival dimension basically with China promoting different uh, socioeconomic system from, from ours. Uh, uh, then uh, uh, on uh, on Middle East, I would probably uh, uh, a, a part of the conflict in Middle East we are uh, facing right now. Uh, I probably would extend it to the southern neighborhood. Uh, uh, what we see there uh, currently uh, are uh, strong import substitution policies. Uh, 
and that certainly can also affect EU uh, trade flows and, and foreign investments. So we believe that in, in, instead uh, efforts should be made to improve uh, business and investment climate to attract uh, sustainable investments. But nevertheless, uh, this uh, temptation, temptation to impose uh, uh, protectionist uh, policies are uh, there, and uh, we um, uh, we clearly will need uh, to deal with this. Another question I wanted to briefly uh, outline in this more conflictual uh, geopolitical context is our economic security strategy. Because uh, uh, clearly, while remaining open, we also need to see uh, 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 how to protect our uh, interests of uh, national security and public uh, order. So um, that's why we uh, came as European Commission with economic security uh, strategy. So meaning maintaining and growing our uh, partnerships around the world, remaining open, but addressing uh, identified risks in a targeted way. So basically there are uh, three uh, prongs in our economic security uh, strategy, uh, promoting the EU's uh, competitiveness, uh, protecting our economic security by using a range of existing tools and considering new ones, and uh, partnering with a broadest range of uh, reliable partners to uh, strengthen uh, the diversification and resilience of supply chains. Uh, in terms of uh, work on existing and uh, new tools, uh, just, uh, just to outline them, uh, we are uh, um, looking now at our foreign direct investment screening regulation to uh, address FDIs, which may impact economic, uh, 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 which may impact uh, public order or national security. Uh, export controls uh, are clearly becoming more and more pro prominent issue, and also we're looking at the issue related uh, risks posed by outbound investment as a which may be a way to bypass export controls, but that's basically the new area for us uh, uh, to look. So we are uh, relatively cautious on uh, on this. Um, and uh, just to wrap up the soul, uh, because the question was uh, what uh, what's the impact uh, for uh, for uh, fiscal policies? Uh, I think um, also in this more conflictual geopolitical context, it's important that we are having our own house uh, in order and uh, ensuring the uh, uh, macroeconomical and financial stability, including by means of a sound uh, fiscal policy. In a sense, we need resilience at home to be also able to tackle challenges coming from uh, from abroad. Th th thank you, Valdis. I mean, clearly, when if you did comparisons between uh, where we are and uh, where the US is, and, and Sylvia raised some of the comparisons, numbers earlier on, uh, the, the obvious and glaring difference is, is uh, the central fisc fiscal capacity. So, so Jeremy, um, I mean, there's basically sometimes articulated in two ways. One is a central fiscal capacity can help us provide European public goods, uh, you know, so whether that's to fund the, the green transition. Uh, early on, we, we heard about schemes where you would target cross-border investment. So that's one vision. The other vision, which it could be complementary, it could be orthogonal, is macro stabilization. So, so, so at one level, my question is, you know, what we want or, or what is needed from a central fiscal capacity. And then second, of course, is, uh, especially since ne next generation EU was, was uh, clearly had a very state contingent nature is a response to the pandemic. Uh, what are the necessary and, uh, and sufficient conditions to see a more permanent feature? And let me vary that between absolutely permanent, it's there, mm -hmm. versus uh, state contingent. But what states of the world are we likely to see uh, more of a central response? Okay, so what I would like to see is a, a permanent uh, fiscal capacity that responds to a structural need for European public goods uh, that are most obvious, I think, during the green transition, but this will uh, take us for a while. So this would be green public investment that are related to, uh, and why at the European level? Well, because of the massive externalities, right? The, the 
the goals are formulated at the European level, the instruments are mostly at the national. If we have some instruments at the uh, European level that would actually help make those targets credible, then we have uh, some uh, investments which have cross-border externalities uh, beyond just emissions. And, and then finally, when it comes to economic security, of course, that is a joint uh, European interest. And so even here, you know, to the extent that we're thinking of uh, some forms, very judicious forms of industrial policy, they should be funded and executed at the European level. And that way we keep the level playing field and avoid the state aid problem, right? So there's there's this very straightforward, I think, argument to have a, a permanent capacity. Now, how do you deal with the... Uh, with with uh, macro stabilization aspects well in part by borrowing right so by debt financing it so that gives you if you like an automatic stabilization property of that capacity to the extent so i, I would mostly make it about european public goods and not mainly about macro stabilization certainly the permanent part of the capacity right if we have another need for a huge discretionary injection we can probably pull off something like the NGU again in in the in, in the face of a very clear and present uh, danger, right? But but I think this would then be uh, ad hoc. The main then the question is: to, if we make it permanent, should it be in the form of a fund of the type that uh, uh, Hul uh, just talked about, and that others, including Luis, who is here, have have uh, written about in, in the past and or should it be in addition to the EU budget? And this I would mostly answer in a pragmatic fashion. Uh, I think that it turns out, ironically perhaps, that from a legal perspective, it is easier to debt finance the EU budget than to debt finance a fund. And, and the reason for that is that when you debt finance a fund, it is considered externally assigned revenue or other revenue, and the uh, European law, for very intuitive reasons, puts qu quite narrow limits on trying to do things off budget, right? Uh, so if, if you really want to go with debt financing, this is fine, but you need to do it on budget. You need to change the own resources decision of the EU to essentially declare debt in own resource. If you do that, it is sort of legal under the treaty. It does require un unanimity. And then, of course, you need to provide a future revenue flow that will service that, uh, that debt. Uh, but you could do it with the usual uh, advantages of debt. Uh, in particular, if you, if you designate debt and own resource, you could also uh, refinance a debt that amortizes with new issuance. Uh, of debt. The, the big problem here is not legal, it's, it's political, and the point, of course, is that there will, is a food fight between the European level and the member state level on the genuine own resources, so the revenue flows that would finance the debt when it comes to assigning those to the European budget. So you need to make a very clear efficiency case that it's better to do some of these things at the EU level. But then I think what would also be important is to sort of be creative about tapping revenue sources. And here, I mean, Valdis knows a lot more, but I, I think, you know, even the very modest own resource proposals that the Commission made, I believe, in June have run into trouble, which is depressing. Uh, and, you know, one way potentially, and here I'm fantasizing, of, 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 of getting this unstuck, just conceptually, would be to tap uh, a revenue base that is not actually used by member states very much these days, and that would be a net wealth tax for the super rich. Uh, so uh, if you could do that, it would be great because, you know, it's not taking money from the member states, it would be something new. There's an initiative uh, sponsored by uh, some socialist MEPs uh, that's going on right now, and I basically wish them uh, the very best. Very good. So, um, uh, uh, let let me uh, take take a few minutes, and we'll go over the five thirty deadline a little bit, just to create some room. Uh, so, I think it's probably efficient if I just collect short questions from from the from from the uh, from the floor, uh, and then I'll see what what the panel members want to respond to. So, uh, if you want to, so, uh, Bayat. Thank you very much. Um, 
Just one question on next generation EU and what that could mean going forward. Uh, of course, as uh, Commissioner Dombrovskis said, um, at the time it was very much uh, done under the condition that it was a one-off. But at the same time, many people would say, well, if it's going to be a success, uh, if it's seen as countries making good use of this money and so on, uh, there could be, you know, some form of of of, of uh, fiscal capacity or no new type of of this form could uh, come out of it. Now, I don't expect, you know, Mr. Dombrovskis to necessarily comment on this, but maybe the other ones in terms of, you know, how how uh, how do they judge the success of this so far, and are we on a way where yes, uh, fiscal capacity is more realistic now, or the opposite, where this isn't really going that well. Thanks. Okay. I'm next going to ask uh, Lewis Garacano, but then I'm going to look at this side of the room. Um, so so uh, now's the opportunity for those of you who sit over on that side of the room uh, to see if you have a question. But in the meantime, uh, uh, Lewis. Yes, this has a right wing uh, biased uh, right wing of the room. Um, so so um, a couple of comments, very, very interesting remarks. Just one one comment which is uh, political and goes to the politics that Jeremy was discussing now. So, so when, when the whole RRF discussion happened, obviously the parliament, uh, the, the parliament and, and many, many of us was pushing for two things, right? On the expenditure side, public goods, uh, on the revenue side, common revenue on resources for Europe. Um, the problem is once that gets to the council, etc. There is nobody who defends any of those two things. So none of the money went for European public goods. It was all basically appropriated by the member states. And every time there's a new source of revenue, instead of going to own resources, uh, it's going to the countries kind of get their hands on it. Whatever the new source of revenue is, is basically flowing to the country. So uh, what, what appeared at the, at the moment to be the start of a Hamiltonian moment for Europe I mean, you needed sources of revenue to pay for that and, and, and European expenses, and none of the two things happened. So I, I guess looking back, it's probably, it's probably a, a failure for Europe uh, to a large extent. I don't know if anybody wants to comment on that. Who is arguing for Europe and who's arguing for European public goods? When, when microeconomists talk about it, it sounds like, yeah, this sounds sensible, but nobody in the council is saying, oh, let's do more things together. Everybody wants money for themselves. That's what ended up happening. Um, second comment is on the banking union, which is also something that when economists talk about, it always sounds like, yes, we should do banking union. And I think we've all heard the phrase, we need to complete the banking union. Now, I don't, I wouldn't even say complete the capital markets union because uh, that's, that's, that's even like uh, less, less near. But the banking union we've heard for a long time, but the truth of the matters, uh, and Mr. Dombrovskis knows that very well, is that um, just, just basically at the time of the approval of the TPI, I don't know if coincidentally, uh, the roadmap that was being negotiated by the Eurogroup to start to complete the banking union, the deposit insurance, was basically abandoned. They just said, look, we're not going to do this. So, I mean, banking union has gone from being a project that we were hoping to complete to not right now. I don't think, I mean, hopefully Ms. Dombrovskis corrects me, but it's not even in the books right now. I mean, it's not, we're not even making progress towards it. There is some crisis and resolution uh, things kicking around, but nothing for the post insurance uh, as far as I can tell. So so the politics of these two issues, the, the common fiscal capacity with common revenue and the banking union, which are two key elements to, to make the governance, uh, the, the, the governance, the reforms that the EMU needs uh, seem impossible right now to me. Thank you, Lewis. So uh, as I said, uh, uh, there's a reserved uh, uh, affirmative action slot over here. So does anyone want to raise a question? Please, Christiane. I, I take the affirmative action and uh, I have the question, a question on the central fiscal capacity, because when you argue about it, you, you talked about EU public goods. The question is, shouldn't European public goods actually be financed by the EU budget? So in other words, we should advocate for a bigger EU budget. And shouldn't the central fiscal capacity actually really be for stabilization? Because this kind of, you know, this lack of having sort of a, a fiscal stance, a common fiscal stance, and, and then having that sort of a sort of a counterpart in a way um, to also what monetary policy is doing, wouldn't that make more sense? So reserve the central fiscal capacity for stabilization. Thank you. Uh, Sander? Yeah, I just had a question for Ru and Jeremy, because if I listen to you, uh, in my impression is basically this, this fiscal rule reform works for five years, 
if I listen to you, Jeremy, because after that, we are in a world where it's imposing unrealistic requirements, and that's a world in which countries break the rules, right? So, and then if I think about the, the fiscal capacity discussion, NGU runs out 2026. Um, we have a bunch of cohesion money that's not being absorbed at all, and it's allowed to be absorbed by the N plus three rule, so it can go into the next MFF, which means that more or less at the same time, we really start running out of European money. So are we headed for a scenario where the entire fiscal settlement has to be renegotiated in five years? And of course, uh, let's not, not even uh, begin to start thinking about the, the expansion of the EU and the fiscal implications of that. Uh, Ramon? Yeah, more on that. <clears throat> One thing that it's sort of amazing seeing from outside is that the discussion of the rules, it seems like it's done as it was doing 20 years ago, except that now we have more experience. But we, not only we have more experience, EU has changed dramatically. For example, we have one third of the EU debts in EU institutions. We don't have a common debt policy because there is no such a thing as a fiscal authority to do that, to coordinate what to do with that. When we talk about the public goods, it can be different. You say, okay, maybe we don't have a way to do it physically to have this uh, fun. But in any case, we are making commitments to the countries. So who is putting all the numbers together? And when the commission says, oh, now we're going to have all these things about green defense, blah, 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 blah. And in addition, we're going to do uh, stabilization. And in addition, we're going to have to do something with the debt we have. Who puts all these things together? And I think it's when I talk about the stability fund, which is a little more than that, is about this thing. And that requires some independence from the commission. Because the commission is the one who's going to make, now making commitments which go way beyond their term. And a good thing of a permanent institution is that things far sided, and therefore everyone is on that. If one has something like that, then the IFIs can play a much of a role because they have someone to back and someone to refer to. In the same way, the, SC, the central bank has someone to talk to. So I will be more ambitious, even if, of course, that's not on the table. Uh, so over here. Yeah, Giovanni from the ESM. I have one question that is connected to the one of Sander and, and Ramon. That is, how do the panel see the, the, the functioning of these the, the fiscal rules in times of tensions? In the sense that, yes, not only they work under the next five years, but they work under times in which rates are under control, in a sense, and spreads are under control. There is a technical element, for instance, that I think of rates projection are based on market forward. So if uh, markets start to doubt the, the, the capacity and reprice the risk premium, then this increase the need for fiscal adjustment. So it makes the fiscal adjustment even bigger by increasing the interest payments down the uh, down the horizon. So is uh, uh, what are the mechanisms that can can re uh, do you think these mechanisms can really work to to make the the, the fiscal situation uh, self-adjusting also in times of uh, of tensions. Thank you so much. So, thank you. So um, a lot a lot of different uh, questions and uh, comments have been made there. Uh, so I'm just going to ask the the uh, panelists to pick and choose uh, if, if there's anything there that that they has sparked a, a, an insight or, or a response. So let me go in reverse order. So uh, Jeremy. Okay, uh, Christiana, thank you so much. I guess my view is we, we need a federal budget and not a central fiscal capacity. And so my first uh, preference would be to expand the EU budget, debt finance it, and then you don't need this macro stabilization stuff because that would happen through automatic stabilizers to the extent that that's not enough because you know even in my wildest dreams, the EU budget will be small. Uh, we can always do a new NGU type fund ad hoc. So the answer is no, I don't think we, we need a central physical capacity outside the, 
the budget except through this ad hoc thing. Sanders' point, will there be a renegotiation in five years? Is the whole term credible? So, uh, so I, I, I think actually it, it, uh, what is not credible is the sort of long run 10 year beyond 10 years torture instruments uh, it, that's just a fantasy what is not credible is is this you know deficit resilience stuff going on for for a generation i think the four to year four to seven year thing is credible or could be made credible i mean it's been taken incredibly seriously by member states and you know, it will probably not work as intended, but the, the bar is very low. The bar is, it, it has to work better than the, than the old system. So I think, yeah, they, they're going to come up with this, they're going to implement it, and, you know, something will happen. And then after four years, there will be the new application. And I, I think there will simply be a new application of the existing system. I don't think there will be a new system in, in four years. And this, these, you know, these 10 year out things are going to be completely irrelevant. I have no idea how they are thinking of why this would ever be relevant if after three, four years you come up with a new plan. I, I have no idea. In my view, it's pure window dressing. Italy should just shrug and sign. And then um, maybe can the new system work to deal with tensions it, it depends on what you mean by tension political or or shocks 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 for yeah no no i mean reprise, yeah. look we beat up a lot on this new system it's much better designed than the current one these are supposed to be net expenditure paths they're supposed to be immune to interest rate interest shocks right immune to output shocks everything is uh is automatically stabilized and then we have two not one but two escape uh, uh, um, clauses so in principle this stuff is is very well designed the only problem with it are these ridiculous sort of you have to do 0.5 this year you have to do 0.3 this year right that's where the conflict might come from but then there are wise people sitting next to you who say look at the end of the day, the Commission has a lot of discretion about what to do with these uh, with these um, excessive deficit procedure and this new, you know, semi excessive deficit procedure that they are inventing. So I would be quite sanguine that actually, yeah, it is flexible enough. Thank you, Valdis. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, maybe uh, let me first uh, touch upon some points on the uh, banking union, which Louis raised, and then I'll also go to those broader EU budget um, uh, topics. Uh, uh, well, uh, indeed, uh, uh, the point was that um, we are all talking about concluding the banking union, uh, but um, uh, Eurogroup was not able to agree on the roadmap towards uh, completion of the banking union. So uh, what they were able to agree, however, is that the Commission should file the proposal. Uh, and the Commission filed the proposal on crisis management deposit insurance. Uh, uh, and all in all, I would say the debates on this uh, legislative proposal are uh, constructive. They are not easy because, in a sense, same things which member states were not able to agree in context of a roadmap are the things they are now not able to agree in the context of the Commission legislative proposal. But all in all, I'm modestly optimistic that we'll be able to make progress. Uh, not during this legislative cycle. I don't think it can move this fast. But uh, all in all, I think uh, we are able to actually uh, land this proposal. And that would be another step uh, uh, towards uh, completion of the banking uh, union. Uh, then uh, there was a question on this uh, fiscal capacity versus a bigger EU uh, budget. Well, that also may be a topic of uh, terminology. Uh, well, uh, on one hand, uh, it, indeed, uh, there's nothing uh, preventing us to have discussions about a bigger EU uh, budget uh, as a way uh, to finance common European uh, goods. Uh, maybe where the difference with fiscal capacity comes in that it's uh, debt financed, whereas EU budget is uh, balanced according to the treaty. It has to be balanced. It already took some legal acrobatics to arrive at uh, this construction for next generation EU being debt uh, uh, financed. So that may be a difference between bigger budget and fiscal uh, uh, capacity. In terms of uh, stabilization function, well, we have European uh, stability mechanisms They're already now, for example, in the context of COVID proposed uh, certain precautionary uh, instruments, as this pandemic crisis support uh, 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 with a 
uh, ratification of new ESM treaty, uh, should that be finalized, uh, there is even more scope for precautionary instruments in a context of ESM. So ESM can uh, provide this stabilization uh, function. Uh, 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 and then, uh, well, the ad hoc uh, fiscal capacity, as we had in the context of next generation U, indeed can help address some very large unexpected economic shocks like we had with uh, COVID uh, uh, pandemic. So, but uh, politically, this uh, discussion is not going to be easy uh, because, uh, well, the same uh, uh, countries which had been uh, very uh, clear about next generation EU uh, being one of instrument. Uh, uh, and I remember, for example, when we were uh, having just, just another uh, recovery and resilience dialogue with European Parliament, uh, Hardly any of those dialogues uh, goes by without some member asking this question. What about making this uh, RRA for next gen EU uh, per moment? Uh, and uh, uh, we're attending these events together with Commissioner Gentiloni, and we kind of did not, on one occasion, completely slammed the door for this proposal. And that was before ratification of the relevant decisions by Finland, and it was a big scandal in Finland and almost derailed the ratification of uh, this whole next generation EU package uh, there. So <laughs> I think you use a certain uh, indication, but then the same countries which are insisting next generation EU uh, being one of are the same countries which are saying no to the bigger EU budget. So politically, it's not going to be easy uh, discussion. Well, in terms of this uh, uh, kind of uh, distribution of EU funding flows over the time, on this I'm more optimistic because uh, indeed uh, now uh, next generation EU and RRF is more front loaded uh, with a peak absorption uh, was supposed to be this year. Okay, maybe it's going to be next year. But in any case, the peak absorption of RRF is going to be before peak absorption of cohesion in this uh, financing period. So from that point of view, uh, it can actually help with more steady EU financing uh, flows over this uh, financing uh, period, which uh, uh, which um, certainly is uh, uh, helpful. I probably stop uh, here. Okay, thank you. Well. Thanks, Philip. Um, just to be clear, um, I think you know um, having an increased EU budget would be preferable to a fund. But I think it's easier to uh, you know to establish a new fund than to increase the EU budget uh, because that would then be um, kind of a you know status quo point, yeah? and some countries would fear that the EU budget could never go down. Um, so, but. Um, I think coming back to the questions here, if I understand them correctly. Um, so we are now dealing with the fiscal rules and um, in a way, uh, this is, you know, just dealing with part of everything that is that needs to be dealt with. And I understand why, because, you know, it's politically much more difficult to deal with, uh, you know, wider, wider range of issues. But that also means that there is, you know, in in a way, we are dealing in an incremental way with the issues that, you know, that, that have to be dealt with. And so maybe the outcomes are then not consistent. And in a number of years, we will maybe need another uh, reform of the rules. In 99, um, we as EFB, we wrote a report for uh, then uh, President Juncker of the European Commission, in which we also made some proposals in a way on the deeper governance. So, for example, there we proposed a uh, you know a full time uh, chair of the eurogroup to have more uh, how you say more permanency in uh, you know in, in in the in the policies um we actually we advocated uh, you know an independent institution that would look at you know when would a general escape or when would a national or general escape clause be applied etc so i think there is also needs to look more deeply in the at the uh, at the governance and uh, not only the fiscal rules but also what is below it eh? so issues of permanency uh, indeed that you know that you know the counterparts have a uh, in a way a permanent uh, institution uh, to talk to uh, I, I very much agree with that thank you thank you Sylvia uh, on the fiscal rules I would 
uh, I mean, Jeremy said that the bar is low to do something better than what we have. Uh, I agree. I mean, that after four years or three years of discussion might be assessed as a failure not to agree on anything, but I also think that uh, it would be a failure for the credibility of EU institutions if once we agree on a system, the system is then not respected and becomes, um, you know, de facto not not binding or not relevant after a year, perhaps not after five. And uh, the second one aspect that I think is also important, at least for the for for us, for the practitioner, is um, I mean there was an an excellent conference in Luxembourg at DSM, and everybody seems to agree that the system is not going to be that simple. Something that we had agreed with all these safeguards, and I think it would be useful to have at least uh, you know data in real time on uh, that that uh, the Commission will assess. To, uh, to determine whether some certain fiscal adjustment has been met or not met, what is the fiscal stance? I mean, to be fair and honest, I'm not able to reconstruct or replicate the fiscal stance using the new rule that the Commission has because I don't have the data. And I think that's something that impacts also from the investor side uh, on the credibility of the EU institutions. On the last word on the federal budget versus, uh, you know, stabilization funds versus what Luis was saying, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, perhaps we really should think about uh, the, the various layers of governments, right? <laughs> and how much we want fiscal policy to be centralized versus decentralized. I mean, we can have a bigger federal fund, budget fund, but the reason why nobody wants it is because nobody wants to give up what you have in terms of national sovereignty. And at the end of the day, we need to, to sort that out at some point. Thank you, Sylvia. I mean, I think everyone here probably knows Mario Draghi's speech from this summer about the urgency of actually building that European political identity. Because, you know, we are in this kind of slow moving uh, situation where where uh, probably the end point everyone might say okay eventually we'll get there but the timeline is is uh, very uncertain so with that uh, I, I with by by overrunning the panel I, I've solved the problem of how how to spend those thirty minutes between the the end of the session and and um, the, the 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 drinks at six o'clock but now you have a smaller problem to solve <laughs> uh, but be, before that uh, let, let me uh, thank again the panelists for, for uh, very wide-ranging uh, very expert uh, contributions so thank you very much <laughs>